afternoon to the audience. Thanks so much for coming and joining us for this session. And thank you to the panelists. I'm May in Ireland from Achieving the Dream. And we're really excited to have this conversation uh, today, really thinking about what it means to provide a holistic approach to student supports. And for Achieving the Dream, when we think about holistic student support, we really frame that as a streamlined, personalized, uh, integrated student experience in which all students are creating career and academic and financial plans. Um, they're only having to tell their story once. They're making meaningful connections, um, having that sense of belonging, and they're getting um, connected in a, in a proactive way to the supports that they need to support their full lives, their, their work, their family, their career aspirations, all of these pieces. And we're, it's great that we have this, panelist, this, this group of panelists today that really represent different perspectives on this topic and also have different pieces of this holistic puzzle that I think we're trying to, to put together for students. Um, so we have Frederick Morrow, who is the CEO of First Hand, Donald Generals, who is the president um, of Community College of Philadelphia, Pam Ettinger, who is the president of Bunker Hill Community College, and Dale Allen, who is the president and co-founder of Dexterra Institute. Um, you'll notice we had one panelist, uh, Daniel Jamel, who was unable to join us because of travel issues today. But we're really looking forward to this conversation. And I do hope that it's going to be more of a conversation than just me kind of back and forth with the panelists. When we met, we talked about three specific kind of areas that we want to try to cover um, in our conversation today. One is starting out trying to just frame, well, what is the challenge that a holistic student support approach is trying to address? And what's the role of data te and technology in this? We also want to talk a little bit about who are the stakeholders in this? What are the behavioral changes that we're trying to really generate in, in moving toward a holistic student support approach? And then finally, what does success look like? So wh what will that look like when we're successful in this new, model, in this new approach? Um, and in some ways, that's also that visioning piece. What is the, our vision of the kind of future of student success. So those are the three buckets, and I want to actually just get started again, want people to jump in, but I want to start with the presidents to start framing this issue of, okay, what is the challenge? What are, what are we seeing happening with students um, that's really drawing out this need for a holistic student support? Donald, do you want to start? Sure. The, the, the challenge is, is that I, I think, especially in community colleges, it's bumping up against a long tradition of academic support versus student support. Mm -hmm. um, I having, you know, this is my 34th year in higher education and um, at least part of that time I, I served in student affairs and, you know, part, part of the, the challenges with student affairs is that it's often viewed as not being at the core or at the heart of, of the academy where academic affairs is. So I thought the idea that placing the student at the center mm -hmm. was something that is, is a fairly um, progressive idea in, in higher education. And so um, tearing down the silos, making sure that there is true integration between what happens in the classroom and what happens with the student support, um, encouraging the stakeholders to be proactive in ensuring that that integration happens in terms of some of the referrals and the technologies that are used to make sure that students in the classroom have the support that they need and that there is an alignment between what they're doing in the classrooms and the supports that they need outside of the classroom, both in mm -hmm. terms of the developmental support as well as their, their academic support and their, their, um, you know, their vision in terms of what they want to do, their career mm -hmm. support. Right, so like holistic in terms of the student, but also it sounds like in terms of how the institution functions Absolutely. as a whole. Great. Crit critical part is how the, inst the culture of the institution is, a, is really a key part of this whole thing. Great. And Pam, from your perspective around the, the challenge that we're really addressing with this. It, it is what you just said. Um, it, we can all sit in a room, you know, the three or four of us who are doing leadership work and paint this picture. But the hardest part for me is taking this narrative and making sure that all the different pieces of the network that makes up the ecosystem of the college are really telling the same story. Right? So if I go to our, our faculty, their idea of being ready for students um, is very different than the, than the folks who are in student development or the folks who are in my foundation trying to do basic needs work, you know, mm -hmm. bringing enough money to the table. Um, and Bunker Hill is a, is a pretty diverse campus, uh, both in terms of age and ethnicity and all of the intersectionality that you can think of these days. And 
a lot of times we still get the old narrative of how, well, the students have to be ready for us. Well, no, we need to be ready for the students. So we're doing a lot of blowing up, I, I probably shouldn't use that word again, blowing up of the old systems in order to come back together and tell a different story. So is that storytelling that I find really difficult? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Dale, what about from your perspective? Well, so uh, just you know, by way of context, so um, I spent 35 years in higher ed leadership roles and helping to transform institutions. But for this role in community colleges in Massachusetts, Pam and I crossed over a little bit and with the Department of Higher Ed and, you know, you made a comment before about uh, the, the pieces of the institution. The student only have to tell the story once or mm -hmm. get the intervention once. And I think that one of the biggest challenges we have is that doesn't happen. Every student goes into every office and tells the story over and over again. And it isn't shared and it isn't communicated both because of technology but also because of the people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in particular at community colleges, where we see that students have life intervening every day and they need more supports and services and they need to be holistic, mm -hmm. and we're getting there. Mm -hmm. um, but that to me was always the biggest challenge is that we make people, every step is harder. Every time I have to talk to another person as a student, I'm more likely to walk out the door. Mm -hmm. And that burden for that student, it's so um, traumatizing for them, especially if you're unemployed or underemployed or perceived to be underachieving. And so we have to do everything we can as systems that use technology, but rely on people and the talents in these different silos. I, I don't like to use that, but I think that's what we see. This fractionalized approach where we need to be able to bring that into a holistic team environment mm -hmm. and technology not getting in the way. I now work and run a technology company. It's a consortium of colleges and universities who share that vision and want, we enable them to have a digital exchange of information across the student information system, the LMS, or anywhere they share, have data. And that's a great vision, and we want to be a part of that ecosystem to be developed, but it will do nothing unless the culture supports mm -hmm. comprehensive student supports and with the student at the center. Um, and so we're uh, eager to participate, not only in the panel, but also just in that whole futuristic development. Mm, great, yeah, yeah, Patrick. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I hear what you guys are saying in terms of breaking down silos, putting the student at the center, but I think there's, there's actually a bigger problem the way I see it, which is the fact that you know, if you are successful in your view, the student walks up on the stage, they collect their diploma, and you get credit for a job well done, but what if they walk off of that stage and into their parents' basement, and they take a job that doesn't require a college degree, and they get stuck with that job for a long time, and they can't repay their student loans? That's a bigger, broader problem. I don't think that one's properly introduced in the way we think about student success today. You know, we work in our, my company firsthand with a lot of career offices all over the world, and for most universities, the career office is an afterthought. Uh, but when you think about students and their stories, stories are all about inspiration. Stories are all about highlighting, to me, a path to success. And so we need to show students not just a path to academic success, but a path to career success, to economic success. I think that's the broader challenge we need to talk about. Can I just follow up on that? Uh -huh. and, yes. and maybe I'll put it back to you two, because I, I think, I mean, I've seen this big shift in interest in how to align labor market information with academic pathways and persistence goals and retention goals that meet the traditional economic measures that we use in a bureaucracy, mm -hmm. both at the state and at your institutional level in iPads, but I also with the change of higher education where we are going more towards competency-based components or certificates that meet a need in the workforce, mm -hmm. I think colleges are starting to do more of that alignment up front, but a long way to go on how to actually get the placements and engagement with career opportunities and alumni in the back end, which is, I think, where you go. But I, don't, I would turn it to you two. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that is true. Um, for quite a while now, you know, the sexy measures are, are retention and completion. And I think ATD actually is beginning mm -hmm. to think about what is the true measure beyond the college's economic impact? What is the person's economic impact? And I think that really is the ultimate measure. Now the barrier there is that you have to do wage matching, right? You have to have a transparent um, unit record system across the United States to do that work. And the, the question- <coughs> No, you don't. Okay, <laughs> so there. Sorry. That's right, Texas just did it. They did it with, in, in a different way, but that is the ultimate measure. It's not about the college. It's about if I get that diploma three years from now, where you measure me, where am I in, in my economic scale? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So maybe we're moving in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. So th th there's a huge reform effort going on amongst the community college, the Guided Pathways model, which mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. precisely what we're talking about. This idea that we're moving away from you know, the arts and sciences or higher education as an end in of itself. You know, the, mm -hmm. you know, allowing the student to sort of very casually find through their own curiosities what they want to do and how they want to do it. That's a wonderful thing and we're not throwing that out completely, but I don't think, especially those of us working in urban environments, students have the luxuries to, to kind of find their way in the sort of meandering way that the traditional higher education um, structures were put in place. So the Guided Pathways does exactly what you're talking about. Um, and it actually starts in high school. I mean, there are, there are models now where you start having conversations. You're not tracking, you're having conversations mm -hmm. about what your interests are and where this might lead to in terms of a career. And you come to the college and um, your, your pathway is, is structured in such a way where it's really, it, it, it aligns the majors into what we, re, we refer to as meta majors. So they're sort of mm -hmm. collapsed into this mm -hmm. huge area. So if you go into health sciences, if you want to be a nurse or you think you want to be a nurse, you're going to a meta major that encompasses issues related to health and health related and community health and so on and so forth. That's as early as your first um, days at the college, which ultimately leads, I mean, it's not finished, it's still a work in progress, mm -hmm. to the types of alignments with the businesses and the industries and the healthcare providers, the hospitals and so forth. So we are beginning to think beyond, um, you know, the, the, the time that the 60 credits or so that they're there to how that moves into, um, into, into a career. But I have to tell one story, something that you mentioned about how disconnected things are. I found out very recently that our students, from the time they apply to the time, even before they get into, into their classrooms, they um, have to change their password and user <laughs> ID three times. Mm -hmm. So we're wondering why they're not getting the messages, they're not going into the right pathways. It's, you know, the technology must be there where we can correct that, where they have one password. So it's the sort of simple, low-hanging fruit things that are preventing us or slowing down our ability to create these alignments and to do away with these yes, silos that we're I think that's a really good segue to this piece around, you know, if we are framing this challenge, and it sounds like we've defined holistic now in a much more holistic or, or even broader way in terms of thinking about not just the whole student, not just the whole institution, but also really how we're placing students into the community and having a community impact. What's the role of, of data and technology in that? And, and what's the appropriate role from your different perspectives of data and technology in this? I'm taking a deep breath on this one. I'm sitting in a, in a, in a conference that highlights educational technology, <laughs> and I feel, like, I feel like the atheist in church. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's a healthy skepticism. Um, Should I move over with the light? Yeah, no, 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 you're good. Right, you, right. Need to, you need to, I, I can be converted. <laughs> <laughs> So part of, the, part of the question that I always have is that technology is all the things that I want it to be, the predictive analytics, the, you know, the, the gathering of data at the end, it informs, it improves programs and all of that. But until I can sit down with my staff in my college and develop a theory of change and know what it is and what the lever, know what my network and system is, know what my levers are that changes behavior, mm -hmm. no amount of technology is going to get my staff to be student-centered. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, the, the atheist will eventually be converted, but I really have to know the theology, right? So that, oh, that, that went a little bit too far. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that is really part of the struggle that we have, mm. which is are we mature enough in our theory of change and in expressing it in, in a narrative for me to take the technology now and to overlay it and to improve it? Mm -hmm. mm. So you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna move closer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, so, right so we, at first time, we're a technology provider. We work with hundreds of, of universities and colleges, and um, technology is an enabler, right? Yes. And what we see consistently, and I think what you'll ask any technology provider out there today, who's your best performing school, who's your worst performing school, what is it that determines that? They'll say it's the people. It's the people, mm -hmm. and they know what they're doing, and they know how to do it. So there's the element of, of, of clarity of vision, what you want to accomplish, for sure. But there's also an element of just having good people uh, yeah. to work with who, who are competent in technology, know how it works. And I think that having good people in that competency, Donald, a little bit extends to your guided pathways vision where I, I see where you're saying that, you know, let's take the coursework that we've traditionally put into these silos and let's just rearrange them and call this the healthcare track and call that the technology track, whatever it is. But there's a missing element of competency here, which I would say, which is teaching people how to apply for jobs, teaching people how to network, teaching people how it's, what it's really like to work in healthcare, bringing in somebody who's done that. 
because the professor probably doesn't know this, right? The professor is an academic, and that's what they've worked their entire lives in. The people in student affairs, the people in career services, no offense to them, but this is where they've spent their lives. They haven't spent it outside of this academic circle. So I think that there's a need to actually bring in some competency here, both on, on the career education side and also on the technology management side to really take advantage of the potential that's there. I mean, we're back to that binary that we always come away with when we're not moving forward in our thinking and that the teachers are there to teach, the students are there to learn. But in the last few years, what I've realized that the really good instructors and teachers actually facilitates the students developing their own knowledge. And they bring new knowledge to the table that changes that paradigm of what teaching and learning is. And I think technology is really helping do that. In our open education resource courses, mm -hmm. When the faculty can't, go, can't find something that's, let's say, culturally appropriate and locally grounded, they'll say to the students, go out and do that survey in the community and then bring back the knowledge so I can plug it in as a case study mm -hmm. into my OER shell. I mean, those things can't just be wholesale imported from a technology company. You really need sort of that melding of the creative energies with the faculty. Yeah, and I would say. And, and technology itself. Most technology solutions are applications designed to solve or analyze some specific thing. Mm -hmm. And usually they work with six, 10, 12 different data points at the institution that they're designed for in one system, the student information system usually, or the LMS usually. Um, and when you as an, a leader, and you as faculty, and you as uh, others on your campus, if you're working on the culture of change, you actually need all the data and information from all those different systems to be aggregated and <coughs> utilized by those applications so you can actually have the right intervention, right? So if, if, what, pick your product. You know, if you want to use a starfish and early alert systems and the uh, uh, awareness that is raised there, if it doesn't consume data from across your institution or it's only utilized by 10% of your employees, it's a waste of money. Um, and I think part of what we tend to do with, when we think about education in ed tech, we think of, I have mobilized my campus, we are gonna do this, and we have selected this product, and it's gonna help us have great success. And then we put a dependency on it, but we don't get the data out of the right places and consume it and produce it in the right play, ways. And so for, for my company, um, Dexter is a nonprofit, as I said before, it's colleges and universities that actually are enabled to use all of their data. And so we actually develop new solutions, provide them for free to our members, and they work with those applications so you can pull data from anywhere. And when you were talking about wage record matching, it's the same problem, as you have data in this system of government about this student, and you want information from that. Um, and you can actually do that, and it's allowable, and there's laws and policy, but the practice is that we're so used to our own silos, we never get outside of them. And so I, on the technology side, a technology enabler, um, we as a technology company talk about what's your problem? What are you trying to solve? We can help you solve it, but you need to know what you're trying to solve and what you're gonna do with it, and then buy the right product. But as we all know, not only are there a lot of ed tech companies here, for campuses, some of them cost two, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to use, with great expected returns. And they don't tend to come true, at least in the short term, until a lot of other issues are addressed. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think, I really don't think you could underestimate the human dynamic that you're absolutely <laughs> dealing with. Um, you know, you said 10%, I don't think it's that bad, but, you know, converting, you know, the very traditional mindset, the very disciplined focus, you know, faculty, for the most part, are disciplinarians. They're, they were grown up teaching the way they were taught behind mm -hmm. a lectern, and um, basically they know a particular discipline. I think it's getting a little bit better, and part of that broader scope of, of, um, op, uh, of, of abilities or, the, the, you know, the capacity to to enable them includes the technologies that are coming through, but it's still a, a fairly large lift in, in these very traditional environments that we're working in. And so you'll have faculty that are pretty, pretty progressive. They want to know what the data is. They want to know how mm -hmm. technology can enable them more. And then you'll have others that are, ah, history is history. I don't care what technology does, and it's going to be my way or the highway. So those of us in leadership position are constantly <laughs> trying to convert the unconvertible in many cases. but. <laughs> You know, somebody said, some, you know, you'll get, you get a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, you're never going to get everybody. And I think the, the key is to show the outcomes, to, sh to demonstrate how these technologies can affect um, um, change and can enable students to be successful um, professionals once they leave our, our campuses and our institution. Um, but the technology enables to the extent that those who are willing to be enabled <laughs> 
will allow, allow the technology to. Um, yeah, and I think there's a there's a there's play. a big educational component of that, yeah. right? And there's also a huge leadership component of that, not only in the president's office but among the faculty leadership and the other. Divisions. Which is more important than the president? They won't listen to me, but they'll listen to their peers. Yeah. I think I think that's that's a key point. Well, there. but and I, but I think that whole notion of leadership and what are we trying to do as educational systems or organizations to deliver on? And, and you talked about the the economic side of it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, we're, I'm a big believer that it, the role of campuses, in particular community colleges, is to help those students get the skill sets and talents so they can make choices in the marketplace and have an economic vibrancy. Even if they choose to live in their parents' basement, that's okay. If that choice is theirs and they're uh, existing. It's generally not a choice, I don't think. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> and generally at my campus, the parents are no longer there. Correct. So, so that's the other piece that I. In some cases, we're never there. Right. right. So, my campus. And maybe right. a grandparent at right. best, right, right. Mm -hmm. in some circumstances. And that's what struck me throughout this conference and often when I talk about education of technologies with folks who supply them, visionaries who supply them, is the assumption that all my students are 17 years old and they call them kids. And I look at them and I say, well, the average age on my campus is 27. Three out of four work, three out of five are parents. So they're no longer children and don't call them kids. And also their orientation towards technology is very different. Mm -hmm. So I think this blanket statement of you know, how is ed tech going to help us along is the wrong research question. Mm -hmm. It's really with this particular profile, with these kinds of restrictions on their lives, how do I enhance mm -hmm. their learning? But somehow we never get to that question. It's always sort of you know, floating on top where there's a silver bullet. So I, I sort of want to you know, get beyond that point. So how do you two see technology being responsive to the different student populations? And again, with this idea of a holistic approach, that means really knowing who our students are mm -hmm. in, a, in a deeper way than a kind of one size fit all. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I hate, which is this notion of working with you know, IT procurement at universities and where they're looking for silver bullets, right? That's they're, right. They're looking for one thing that's But aren't you solve. offering a silver bullet? <clears throat> no, no, we, uh, we actually offer a best in class, best in breed, product focused on uh, mentoring. That's, we're, we're, we're very focused on that. But sometimes we lose out because they say, oh, well, why don't you offer events, email marketing, newsletters, forums? We want to do landing pages too. Can you do that for us as well? And yeah, we could, we could do that strategy, right? We could put our resources to building a crap product that does 20% you know, of what you need it to do, but it, but it checks the boxes and all those things. Or we could do something really, really well. And so our choice is to do something really well. There's others out there who choose to do the 20% solution. And, and my you know, message to, to you guys is you know, be, be, be wary of the silver bullets because as we know, they don't really exist. But in terms of you know, suited, dealing with different populations, yes, there are different problems to be solved, right? There's a million problems to be solved. And I think you need to look at what the best in breed solutions are for each of those problems. I mean, you know, maybe you've got one person in your staff who's dealing with the career office, you give them the best in breed career office solution. Maybe there's one person in your staff dealing with alumni relations, you give them the best in breed for that. LMS similarly, but I think looking for this silver bullet that takes forever to onboard and educate people on and nobody fully gets, gets or uses, this is a complete waste of everyone's time. What if that best in breed onboarding or career alumni doesn't talk to the SIS or the CRM? Like, you know, what if, you know, if we've got a lot of breast and breeds, you know, how do we bring it together? Well, I think, I think that's kind of, living a little bit in the past where yes that may have been the case obviously when you know you started out things things were in physical servers everything's in the cloud increasingly all these solutions have apis that talk to each other it's not so i'm going to disagree with you completely on that last one so everyone has apis but apis don't actually communicate with the legacy enterprise systems or the lms effectively and what ends up happening is pam that's why we have white hair right. <laughs> <laughs> pam gets a bill or a uh, you've signed an applicant you've signed a contract with this great best in breed provider, maybe mm -hmm. it's in one space or it's across multiple, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, and then all of a sudden you get the administrative contract for consulting services to manage integration, mm -hmm. right? You're both nodding your head, you've seen this with every application and it's there true everywhere, <laughs> because no matter what, the student information system and the LMS that they have at their schools that they had no hand in selecting, probably, um, was customized by their local campus because they wanted to make it slightly different to meet their needs. And we want to enable that. That's part of the culture. You want the ownership and engagement. And so what, what we find with Dexterra and what Dexterra is rooted on as a problem is, wouldn't it be great in our environment that we as institutional leaders and providers of education could choose the product we wanted and instead of worrying about the integration, 
we can do it like we do on our phone. That you, as a next generation environment, kind of like your comment, you, you think there's no challenges with SIS, but it's complicated. For them to plug in a best of breed, multi-component thing, think big product and student services that does a lot of stuff for you, potentially, I don't know if you have this contract, but. $120,000 a year, yeah, I have that contract. So you have that contract, and then you are stuck. You're not gonna change that product, and then you have to scale up the use of it, and you are challenged by that. So what we are about is actually the ability for colleges to choose one or 10 different best in breeds and get them all to work together through an integration approach that has connectors, small micro APIs, that connect to the student information and LMS that are designed for that product. And again, we build them in a way, uh, MIT is our technology partner. They're a small technology school in Massachusetts, if you haven't heard of them. Um, if you watch Modern Family, they're called MIT, I believe. Um, <laughs> The, um, but they have been developing this for 17 years and because what they were sick of is everyone on their campus wanted a different application to do something and they couldn't support them all but what they could support is a way for data to be aggregated, anonymized, securely communicated and plugged into the enterprise system or the application you choose. And so Dexterra is all about that but that is a futuristic approach. You will not find that in the marketplace anywhere else you'll have $125,000 contracts for every product that Pam has purchased or Don has purchased at his school for that company or some other outside source to do point-to-point -point integration, which is rewiring the same plumbing or whatever, I'm mixing my metaphors there, over and over again. And we believe that you develop solutions once and then you give them away for your members for free. So our college and university and members, they get access to all of that for free. And so we think that's where technology starts to make a difference when you're not dependent on outside parties and paying money, which you don't have, mm -hmm. right? You're limited in your budgets and you need to do other services with them. And that's where technology makes a difference because then you can optimize your data and your data flows and your use of it and your analytics. And you don't have to worry about, is it gonna work next week? Do I have to pay someone else to do it? And that's the only way technology starts to make a difference if you can use your own data and control it behind your own walls. Because what happens today is those outside parties or those applications ask to access your system of record. Mm -hmm some of your products say, can I come into your SIS? And I don't know about you, but I used to be very leery of people accessing my student information system and system of record, because what are they gonna do with my data? So I wanna pull us back to where Donald started us, um, and because we've hit on a couple different stakeholder groups, thinking about the technology. Um, but that idea of putting students at the center. So thinking of stu students as a, as a stakeholder group in this conversation about holistic supports. Um, you know, what do you think, what are the behaviors that we're trying to intervene on? What are, what, what really are we trying to address with this, um, with students in this new holistic way of approaching student support? I, I, I think um, we want students to come into a learning environment that they know is supportive, is organic, and is holistic. That regardless of the department they go to or the academic um, area that they might go into or the support service, that there's some sense that they continue to be at the center of what's going on. Right now, they go through this sort of linear progression where they go from one office to the next, to the next, to a classroom, and even sometimes within the department. They may have four or five different faculty who have a different approach and different idea, different values about what they mean to, what the student means to, to the institution. So, uh, you know, that's the ideal. I think the technologies can help to, you know, to to secure, to glue, to, to serve as the glue to all of that. Um, but right now, right now, my feeling is that it's, it's, it's very fragmented, that their experience is fragmented. Um, if, if, they, if they're not um, totally prepared, forget about academically prepared, but prepared to deal with an institution <laughs> that's fragmented and that's hostile in many ways, um, or the, the impact of their treatment is hostile, I think that that's why many of them, many of them don't succeed. Um, and community colleges, I mean, you don't have a four year, so I'll speak for, for, for community colleges. Our attrition rates are horrendous. You know, students come and they go. They, I know a lot of, of how they're judged is really based on a traditional model of a four year institution where students are and, um, you know, they stay on dorms and so forth. But nevertheless, if the answer, which I happen to think is the answer to our future as a nation, is in large part community colleges, we have to do better in terms of being able to retain students. And so I, I don't think um, that this idea has fully caught on that the institutions have to sort of um, 
gravitate or, or, or they have to place the students at the center of the institutional culture, the institutional structures, and the operations, of, and operations at, as well as the academics of the institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a part, of it, a part of it really has to do with, the institution really has to like its students. And some of you may, you know, look at me funny and say, well, why wouldn't we like our students? If you've seen some of the interactions that I've seen over the last five years, we don't like our poor students. We don't like our students in distress. We don't like students who don't look like us. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those things comes out in our policies, right? The way uh, policies right now at colleges are not about enabling the students to connect. They're really about how many walls can we put in front of them before right. they can jump over. So that, you know, you sort of now are like the students that I sort of like. Um, and I think that very sense of, of, everybody says they like their students, but do you really? Go look at your policies and see how much right. you like your students. Mm -hmm. And the other is that there are three things, I think, that makes up sort of the support system for an integrated system for students. One is basic needs and finance. Right? You need to be able to pay your bills, you need to have food, you need to have housing, you need to have all of those things. 45% of my students are food insecure, 13% are homeless, and I don't mean just couch surfing. They literally do not have a place to go to other than a shelter. So the basic needs, our students are fragile in that way, so basic needs is one leg. The second leg is the student integrated support that we talked about, um, which is the tutoring, the the place to go, do you have an affinity group? Are you getting the career um, in educational and financial planning that you need at the beginning mm -hmm. and at the end? Mm -hmm. And do you have a pathway? Mm -hmm. Without those two things, I don't care what you're teaching in the classroom, it's not going to take. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, this sort of a three-legged table mm -hmm. um, is, is really what we live with. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it starts with trusting that the student can learn. And sometimes, I don't think that trust is there. And a lot of the leadership work that I do is really questioning that, mm -hmm. right? You say that you like it, you say you're student center, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. And it's not always pretty. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Trusting that the student can learn, is it also trusting that the student wants to learn? Because it strikes me that a lot of this has to do with, with motivation. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't work with full disclosure community colleges, but I imagine if you're in a community college, there's high attrition rates. A lot of it is people asking themselves, I've got a lot of challenges in my life. And you're asking me to go to these classes every day, take you know calculus, statistics. These all, it's really hard. What's it all for? What's what's the whole point of this? I have you have to imagine that a large part of it is the motivation, the motivation to keep going, the motivation to see that there's there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's a version of success where somebody like me could be successful. It, 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 part of the response to that could be that the students are not quite sure yet, right? However, if I'm looking at two-thirds of my students are working almost full-time and three, three, three out of five are parents, you've got to figure that they've got to be pretty courageous to set foot across that, across that threshold. Right? So, so their aspiration is expressed in the fact that they're here mm -hmm. and they're choosing between food and paying the fees or, or having a place to live and buying books. I mean, to me, that is a very clear choice. That may, maybe they're, they're not aspiring, like you know, they see an astronaut and they want to be one. But certainly, they are looking at climbing up and, cli and getting that social and economic mobility. And that's what I mean about trust. If my faculty and staff does not trust that that student is old enough to know where he or she wants to go, then they shouldn't be here. The I faculty and the staff, that is, I not the student. I think they know they want a better life. They may not have made the connection between education and that better life, and somebody told them, go to school and you'll get a better life, but they want a better life. There's yeah. no doubt about that. And um, oh, yeah. I think our mm -hmm. challenge, I think our challenge in institutions such as mine is to help them to understand that the study and, and the grit, you know, I, I we'll really loved yeah. Angela yeah. Duckworth's comments mm -hmm. earlier. She said, pretty much to your point, that they, they, go, they, want an, an, they want a job, they want a profession. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not get the the unfolding flower and the potential and the beauty of an arts and science and how it enriches you as a person and maybe that will come along later. But they come to our doors because they want a better life for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, Philadelphia is a city with 26% poverty and there's probably another 20% one check away from poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. we're dealing with, you know, some, from pr some, pretty, some pretty tough things in terms of who comes to our doors. Mm -hmm. And I think that trust that they want to learn 
you know, I think they can get there if, if they're not there. If they, if they don't have the discipline or the grit or what we as, you know, quote unquote middle class individuals see in terms of delay of gratification and all of those things that ultimately enable you. If they don't have that yet, I think it's our responsibility to help them get there because we know they want a better life. But I think it's also the responsibility to just not just put a nebulous carrot somewhere in the distance for them to walk towards because they don't know how long that's going to take. They don't know how hard that's going to be. And a lot of people are going to run out of energy and courage and, and money and whatever it is b before they get there. You need to make it abundantly clear. It needs to be super clear. What is the next step? And what is the step after that and the step after that? And show them somebody who just walked those steps, who can be the example, who's, who's in their shoes before them. I think there's, there's something to be done there because, yeah, we all want better lives and, and I get the motivations. They're so strong. But unless you see that you're inches away from your next step and then there's the next step, it's very easy to lose faith. Right, so the mentoring and the coaching yeah. really right. is part of that wraparound service. I, mm -hmm. I would tend to agree. So, and, I, and maybe I'll just push in a little bit different direction. So what we're talking about are those that are showing up at your doors, mm -hmm. right? But I think we all are fully aware that education beyond high school is changing dramatically around us. And it's not just showing up at community colleges and traditional four-year institutions. There's other opportunities and credentialing and competency and certificates and badging and things that are done for specific careers or opportunities. And that market, so I'm going to put my economist hat on for a second as a, my PhD is in that space, they may not consider holistic student development the way this conversation is going at all. Mm -hmm. But a whole segment of the folks that used to show up at your doors are now choosing others. But they're probably not the 24% in the poverty. They're slightly above, who have some resource maybe and are going and getting. Well, I'm trying to convince them of the value at it. Well, well <laughs> but so of course the, uh, I, the institutions they're going to are becoming more and more prohibitive. But that's another conversation. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I guess I'm, what I want to push out on is say the ability to do the holistic student development in traditional academic institution mm -hmm. and to maintain and continue the ways we've done things isn't going to compete with those other alternatives, whatever their price may be, that some people are choosing. But if those folks start to get jobs and have economic vibrancy and they can do it in three months or nine months and aren't burdened in their experience with the general education requirements and the 60 credits to graduate, but what are the options you can learn from that and pull into this environment and start to do stackable, accelerated credentials that if I'm unemployed or underemployed, I, we used to always think about it from the student perspective of if you shut that door in my face, I'm walking out. I'm here because I have two kids at home, I'm working two jobs, and I want to get five more dollars an hour. Yeah. I want to get 10 more dollars an hour. Can you help me next week? Can I get that in three weeks or a month? You can get yeah. it in nine months. I mean, I think that's already in the community college environment. We do have the certificates and so on. You, you know where- but, but, but I'm gonna push back and I'm gonna interrupt, I apologize. That is the traditional that certificate, certificate level. I try to teach my kids to do that too, okay. they don't do it. Um, um, they have the certificate levels, traditional 30 credit or so experience or something slightly less. I'm talking about the intensive, what may be a 12 sure. credit or nine credit, that a student can go get a job in a higher level that they're already working at, but still maintain that pathway yeah, within right. you. Absolutely, we, I, I think the stackables are the way to go. And, and they do exist in a community college or, or at least beginning to. One of the nice things about doing that at the community college is that you can continue to get financial aid. And that's one of the key points. Because the students are financially fragile, you want to be able to get them that financial aid in the Pell Grant so that they can you know, at least help their families along. Mm -hmm. um, part of the issue about does everybody need to go to college, I and mean, that's the big thing that's out there, I would say to folks, well, is that my kids or yours that you don't want going to college? <laughs> um, and also, you know, our understanding of the college, and I'm, I'm, I'm of that older generation when college meant something very specific. But I think what, you, what you're talking about is something newer, that everybody needs some post-secondary. Not that everybody needs college, necessarily, mm -hmm. always a two-year or four-year. Mm -hmm. but, but we also can't just say, well, you know, not everybody needs college, because then they would think, high school, that's it, I can survive out right. there, and you can't. Right. You can't survive with a high school diploma. Yeah, and, and, and again, the, the financial aid uh, programs are, are excellent for those who don't have to take on student debt. Mm -hmm. But as you start to build student debt and live in your parents' basement because you can't afford it with whatever job you got, that false promise needs to change too. And so that holistic student approach needs to consider, mm -hmm. and this is back to your point, is 
not only on the mentoring, but can you show them the whole game plan? Can you show them the implications? Can you show them that? And, and you know, I love when I see systems of why he's doing a really good job of this from grade six to 20, where they talk about implications and decision making early and they build it into their curriculum, but they're talking about jobs and credentials and wages so that you know if you go another three months at the community colleges, you're gonna make another $10 an hour. You're gonna get this certificate. You can go on this path for an associate. You can get this bachelor's degree. It's all seamless and transferability. They are a very centralized system though, mm -hmm. which I know Massachusetts is not, and I don't know about Philadelphia, but in, in that world, it's been easier. But they have done a comprehensive culture change to do mm -hmm. that. But they also, there are places that are starting to bring in uh, other providers of education delivery and online capabilities, which are not rooted in the traditional academic institution. Mm -hmm. They're just different delivery mechanisms. And, I, and, and, and so I would push that that public-private partnership model with outside providers, which, which challenges your union environment, but it needs to be done, and that's where you folks get paid a lot of money to be the leaders you are. Who said anything about unions? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it, that environment of we can't do it because, or we shouldn't, no, we need to, because the market has changed dramatically, and again, your current students, you don't see it as much, though it's increasing. Yeah, it's increasing. The next generation you're gonna see, they're gonna come in and say, no, nah, this is the way I do it, this is the technology I use, it needs to be integrated, and by the way, I wanna do online, and I'm gonna do this, and do you have a certificate I can go get a job as a healthcare assistant, or? A, uh, whatever, moving up the healthcare chain or moving up the coding chain. Um, and, and by the way, they're gonna last in life because they learn the skills that a traditional school can provide, but you gotta find a hybrid, I think. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would push back on on the holistic side, that we gotta find a hybrid with what's going on in the market that's competing with our public institutions mm -hmm. uh, to do something different. Well, that, that seems like a good segue to where, you know, I wanna make sure we spend some of our last few minutes, which is really, looking forward, looking, what does success look like? I mean, it sounds like you are kind of, several of you have, have posited different definitions of kind of the future definition of student success, but what does success look like? So, you know, Frederick, starting with you, what is that, what will that be? Um, well, I, I don't think, you know, if, if one of us knew what the, what the future was like, you know, we'd be billionaires at this point and we'd be creating it right now. Uh, we kind of don't know, right? But we do know that we're dealing with people we're dealing with their lives. I think there's a tendency today to, as with all technology, you overestimate its impact on the short run, but the long run, you underestimate its impact. And today we're, we're fetishizing over um, certificates because that's kind of a new thing that we're talking about. It's enabled by you know blockchain, that kind of thing. We're talking about data. We want all our data to be connected and streamlined. That sounds great. We kind of fetishize it because it's new technology and it's something we want to incorporate and it feels like the right thing to do. But at the end of the day, it's about people having success in their lives. And you look at um, employers and surveys, you know, Manpower does a survey of, of every year, they come out and they say, actually, you know, there's so many employers out there who are unable to fill jobs. And when you ask the employers, like, what, what, what is it you're not able to fill? Is it, are you, do you need more people who are data scientists? Do you need more programmers? And, and to a certain extent, yes, that's the answer, but mainly it's, it's, it's the fact that people lack basic social skills like communication, like writing, like interpersonal skills, teamwork, that sort of stuff. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a mentor on our platforms and I talk to students every single week. And where they fail me isn't, isn't when I throw them a math problem usually or I give them, you know, something, a brain teaser to solve. It's often just how to present themselves, how to come across as just uh, professional, likable, uh, just basic skills. And I think that we, you know, in, in our, um, obsession with data and certificates and all of that, we forget, you know, put yourself, you know, put yourself in the shoes of this student, put yourself in the shoes of the employer hiring that student. You know, they could have all the stacks of certificates in the world, but if they can't talk, if they can't write, if they can't work in teams, who wants to work with them? Who's going to give them a job and, and give them their paycheck? Mm -hmm. What does success, yeah, look like to uh, you? So you know, I, I, I've used a couple of different metaphors, you know, the Marshall Plan and, you know, money. And <laughs> I think it has to, I think we have to go big to make the, to, to, to achieve the level of success. Um, you know, higher education, especially community colleges, roughly 50 years in their existence, have spent most of our time trying to separate from K-12 because we want to be confused as grade 13. I really think it's important that we develop a K-16 model yeah. where we're dealing with those students as early as the fifth and sixth grades. And we're talking about things like careers and 
and you know, not a job, but careers, a particular field, understand business. It always amazes me that we, we are a capitalist society, but we don't teach capitalism and money in, 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 in mm -hmm. the school systems. And having the student at that point be the center of this educational enterprise that goes all the way through mm -hmm. 16 and into a, a career. And I think part of the puzzle has to be the businesses, the, you know, the economic aspects of the society helping with the construction of this educational enterprise. We go to the businesses when we want money, and they know that, and they still view contributions to higher ed as sort of their philanthropy. It's not, it really is the bottom line type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think if mm -hmm. that's real, then they have to be involved in how we construct our curriculum and the mm -hmm. skills that, mm -hmm. that's needed. And all of that needs to be embedded in this large enterprise that's mm -hmm. fully funded, that's the other thing, because most <laughs> yeah. of what I'm talking about is just not funded. But it's fully funded and recognizes that the survival of this country, you know, social justice in this country, is going to require pulling those pieces together, education, business, the economy, mm -hmm. the technology. The technology's there. I mean, as, as much as some of us, not me, <laughs> but as much as some may not want to accept it, it's there. And mm -hmm. somebody said earlier, it's not going away. I mean, it's like, it's, a, it's evolutionary. It's going to be here. So we have to, we have to accept it and, and make it part of part the solution of mm -hmm. as opposed to a competitor. Mm -hmm. So I want our faculty and our staff to teach not only what but how. Actually, I think the how is more important than what, understanding that all of the other pieces are changing. I think we can make an assumption that all of the lack of connectivity that we have now will eventually go away. Um, because, and, and, and success looks like an iPhone. Better yet, success looks like an Android phone. <laughs> um, and, and it's achievable. And for our students, I would like them to no longer be the first in the, of anything. Not the first in the family to go to college, not the first to you know, climb this higher education hill. The, the, the lack of, the lack of a, an equity lens coming through both the technology area and the acquisition of knowledge and in the way that our students are treated <coughs> is to me the biggest barrier. And success is when that equity lens is overlaid on everything we do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not difficult, it's just complex. Mm -hmm. Great. Hmm. Great. So I think I'll play off that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, You'll pay me though. <laughs> the normal fee. <laughs> yeah. um, I think for, for, for me it's about um, that those with the least amount of resources should have the same opportunities for access and success and be th supported through technology and institutions or education delivery entities that care passionately about their success. And I think we have this big separation in the traditional space as well as out in the market where those who have more resources in whatever way they garner them get better opportunities and set themselves apart, not only in college obviously but elsewhere but as they get into the educational space, part of this is about them being able to control their data, their information and sharing of that and being able to access and choose things and not be burdened because they didn't have another zero on their financial account. And I think for colleges and universities, the same holds true. For those who deliver it, they should have the same access to technology and the use of their data and control of it, which is part of what our our mission is all about, is those with the least resources should have the same access and success with technology and the ability to use it and not be dependent on outside parties. So I would stretch it to the market and my success is those students with the least have the same percentages of success at any level of education than those who may not look like them, talk like them, or have the pocket of money that the others did. And I think that starts with a holistic approach that we all probably want to be a piece of, or part of, um, but it also means we have to change delivery and change our institutions dramatically to support that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, and I mean, I know that that really uh, is a hard place to end because I think we've almost just scratched the surface with these, these complexities and um, all of the, the ways in which we're talking about needing to change structures and process and behaviors. Um, I want to thank these panelists. I'm walking away with a lot that I'm thinking about. I hope you are too, you know, how we're defining what it means to support students and put students at the center. Really broadening this notion of holistic student support and not just what that means for students, but also who needs to be involved, who needs to be a part of that, that ecosystem. Um, I know the panelists will stay around uh, and be up here for questions, but please join me in thanking them for their conversation. Thank you.